evening family and welcome to our All Hallows evening mini service. It's great to be with you and I really hope that you are with somebody else this evening. So we're going to have some worship and a talk together and then we'd love us to be able to discuss that and continue our learning together with some other people. I'm going to pray now as we begin. Jesus, I thank you that we get to come and worship and learn about you. And I thank you for these opportunities to grow together through discussion on your word. I pray that your presence would be with us, that your spirit would be speaking and that we would be listening. Amen. Every chain will break His broken hearts declare His fame Who can stop the Lord Almighty? Now God is the Lion, the Lion of Judah He's roaring with power and fighting our battles Every knee shall bow before Him Our God is the Lamb the Lamb that was slain The sins of the world His blood breaks the chains Every knee will bow before the Lion and the Lamb Every knee will bow before Him So open up the gates Gates, make way before the King of Kings. Cause the God who comes to save is here to set the captives free. Who can stop the Lord Almighty? Our God is the Lion, the Lion of Judah. He's roaring with power and fighting. Every knee will bow before Him Our God is the Lamb The Lamb that was slain For the sins of the world His blood breaks the chains Every knee will bow before the Lion and the Lamb Every knee will bow before
family, it's me again. I hope you are all well this week. When I was asked to do another prayer slot, I was thrilled to be able to be praying with you again, but I was also finding it a bit tricky to think about what to say on this week's topic. So I kind of spent a bit of quiet time. I leaned into the topic this week and I picked up my trusty journal and I flicked through the pages. And one of the pages that I landed on pretty soon was actually a psalm that I was looking into of obviously at the time of me journaling and it was Psalm 116. And I wrote down different parts of the psalm that stood out to me and spoke to me and the first one was, what shall I return to the Lord for all his goodness to me? And what I wrote underneath that was, how do I choose to live my life and walk with Jesus? Is what I'm consuming good in God's name? And that spoke to me today, and that's what I'm going to pray over with you all, our consumption. What do we consume? So I'm gonna go straight into it. I'd like us just to think for a minute, maybe the first thing that pops into your head about consumption, what do you consume? And if you will pray with me now. Lord, I want to pray over what we let into our lives, what we consume on a daily basis. I want to lift up the constant consumption that we have all around us in the Western world and in our busy lives and in the 21st century, I guess, of where we are now. The constant media, fast news, social media, friends, gossip, workplace, workplace and Hicks, everything that we have going on, there's a lot of consumption constantly within us. And I just pray that you help us to navigate through what we're listening to and what we choose to lean into, Lord. We've got to be wise with what we listen to. How does this shape our life and our journey with you, Lord? And this is what we ask you to help us with. Help us to navigate our thoughts, help us to navigate what we listen to and help us to navigate what we then choose to pursue. Don't let things cloud our judgment. Don't let some of our unwary thoughts cloud our walk with your son, Jesus. We just lift this up to you, Lord, and we pray in God's name. Amen. And I want to leave it on something else that I wrote as well from Psalm 116, which was, The Lord protects the unwary. When I was brought low, he saved me. And that for me just brings this to kind of a great closure in the fact that we might not always consume the, the right things, we can't help it with fast news, with media, with social media, with the internet, things are just coming at us from every angle. But we can trust and know that the Lord is protecting our unwary minds. And when we're brought low by maybe overconsumption, he saves us. So I just want us to carry on praying into that, thinking about what we consume. I know I've said that word a lot. <laughs> and what we choose to lean into and is it the right path that we're following with Jesus. Now with us uh, we have our very own Chris Rogers, our own Reverend Chris Rogers, um, speaking on a very delicate topic but no one better than him to go and speak to us. So with you all now please have a great time. Chris over to you. Good evening, all hallows. So pleased to uh, be with you tonight as we explore another one of our August themes. So during August, we've looked at the topics of loneliness. We looked at the topics of race. What does it mean to be the church and diverse uh, society? Uh, and tonight we're looking at another one of these uh, themes that often we don't explore. And the theme this evening, I've entitled it God, Bill Gates, and the greatest conspiracy theory. The greatest conspiracy theory. Why am I talking this evening about fake news and conspiracy theories? 
Simple as this. I have seen during lockdown some of the most sane people I know spouting the strangest concoction of ideas that you could ever put together. I have been blown away by the bizarreness of some of the things that I have heard during lockdown. And I want to speak into this whole world of fake news and conspiracy theories because Christianity can be a breeding ground for conspiracy theories that fit within our Christian framework. Within this Christian framework, uh, conspiracy theories can look like they make sense. The reality is the devil loves it. The devil loves to plant seeds of deception in the soil of the gospel because it just takes our attention away from what God is doing or what God is wanting to say. The greatest conspiracy theory out there is the heart of Christianity. It's the heart of Christianity. At the heart of Christianity is this understanding that that Satan, the evil one, wanted to confuse and convince humanity that God was not good. And if the devil could convince humanity with the fake news that God wasn't good, then he had won. At the heart of Christianity is this belief that there is an evil at work in the world that is out to confuse. And therefore, when the idea that there could be a one world government that's outlying to us and confusing us, it can fit very directly into a Christian worldview where we believe that there's evil out there that's out to confuse. So what the devil does is he uses our own theology against us. And you end up with very sane, normal people spouting very strange Things. The scripture tells us, Paul says, that we are to be people who are discerning the spirits. We've got to be able to discern between the good spirits and the deceptive spirits. The whole point of the deceptive spirits is that they are cunning and they can sound convincing. And there's a danger sometimes with unwise Uh, thinking that we can be lured by the deceptive spirits and in an internet era of conspiracy theories and lies uh, the internet has become more dangerous and prevalent when it comes around to conspiracy theories and fake news we have been bombarded with fake news so much uh, that we start to question the very fabric of reality Uh, the government's And the media have done a job on us. They've convinced us of conspiracy theories uh, that have now left us questioning the very fabric of reality. Can we trust anyone? Because if we can't trust anyone, then I can only trust myself. And then confused people become more powerful because they think that they are somehow uh, hooking into, oh, I know the truth. Everybody else is confused and it gets dangerous. Conspiracy theories and fake news are in danger of ruining our lives because they uh, convince us of an untruth and we believe it. A couple of things about particularly who could get susceptible to fake news and conspiracy theories. If you are a fearful person, you are potentially open to being duped. If you're a fearful person, you have the potential to be induced. If you are someone that isn't very good necessarily of weighing up all of the facts, you take what you hear and then don't listen to the rest of the facts, you are open to being duped. You are opening, if you open yourself up to confused teaching and don't question it, then you are opening yourself up to being duped. You may listen to some fantastic speaker on the internet with a snappy suit Their argument sounds convincing, but unless you know the counter arguments, you are in danger of being duped. If you don't create yourself wise filters of what you are listening to, then you're in danger of being duped. If you are susceptible to mental health struggles, then you are opening yourself up to the potential of being duped. If you are isolated as a person, you live on your own, 
there is a danger that you are open to being duped. If we think we know more than the specialists and the experts, then you are in danger of being duped. Let me say that again. If you think you know more than the specialists and the experts, then you're in danger of being duped. The number of people that have told me things during lockdown that is in contrast to what the specialists are saying because they think they know better, you're in danger of being duped. Now, Colossians 2.8, this is what I want to just uh, focus on for a moment. Colossians uh, chapter 2, verse 8. See to it that nobody takes you captive through hollow and deceptive philosophy which depends on human tradition and the elemental uh, spiritual forces of this world rather than Christ. I'm going to read this to you again, but I'm going to try and just pull out some of those words and explain that passage. See to it that nobody takes you captive through hollow and deceptive philosophy. You could say it like this. See to it that nobody convinces you, convinces you of deception. See to it that you are not somebody that's easily duped by a lie that sounds convincing but actually is a whole load of rubbish. And these, this rubbish, see to it that you don't get duped by it. And he says, and these things are things that are dependent on human tradition you could say human wisdom or human ideas or human confusion. The scriptures make it very clear there's godly wisdom and there's human wisdom. When I go searching the internet, it's not very far before I find human beings spouting, spouting absolute rubbish and other, other human beings huck, line and sink it in and they believe it. See to it that you are not convinced through deceptions that depend on human wisdom or human ideas and on the dark and the demonic. If you believe in the demonic and you believe in the spiritual forces of evil, then you have to also believe those spiritual forces are out to dupe us. They want to give us convincing arguments that look spiritual and look God like God, but actually they don't match the worldview of a Christian. One of the things that these spiritual forces love to do is almost turn up um, the furiosity of our religi religious faith. And you end up with Christian fundamentals who walk around as, as if uh, they're gods themselves and uh, they, they can't be harmed. You know, one of the things I hear a lot is, I'm washing the blood of Jesus. And people walk around saying, I'm washing the blood of Jesus as if they're somehow now superhumans and nothing can get them. And there is nothing <laughs> more demonic by, uh, by the idea. When the scriptures tell us we're washed in the blood of Jesus, it's about salvation from the freedom of our sins, that God wants to protect us from sinfulness. Jesus is not an inoculation from COVID. Uh, if you are a Christian, it does not mean that you're not going to get COVID. Another conspiracy theory that I have heard during lockdown. Christians are not immune to conspiracy theories. In the beginning, God planted a garden in the east, in Eden. And there he put Adam and Eve. And soon after, Satan entered the garden and spread the first conspiracy theory. Satan convinced Adam and Eve that God was not good. It was the first fake news. And COVID lockdown has been a ripe time for confused ideas about where this came from. And the evil one has absolutely loved it. He has convinced sane, normal people that 5G technology created COVID. And in the Midlands of England, people were setting fire to 5G antennas to stop COVID. Sane people behaving in an insane way. The virus, I've been told by some people, is a human bioweapon created by Bill Gates. Totally in contrast to the reality of the work that Bill Gates has done to eradicate poverty in the world, 
The fact that he has given away his wealth, that he doesn't want to hold on to it, he's generous in giving it away, yet this conspiracy theory that Bill Gates is out for our money to create uh, the antidote to COVID. Sane people believing insane things. I've heard people say that there is no virus. It's all about the government controlling us. In contrast to the fact that we have seen people get sick with it in our own community. I have been told that there's a one world government hiding behind the governments of this world and they're actually in control. They're the ones that created COVID. I've heard so many uh, random and bizarre conspiracy theories about this person called QAnon. And please don't Google it. Such confusion and conspiracy and fake news has bred during lockdown. Why? Because we've been fearful. When fearful people look for answers, we go to all the silly places. The whole point of a conspiracy theory is it's hard to argue against because it's so irrational that you can't argue against it. There's been these cons dangerous conspiracy theories going around that Christians can't get COVID. The number of blogs, I'm not going to wear a mask because Christians can't get COVID. I've heard this phrase spoken so many times. I've been washed in the blood of Jesus. I can't get COVID. In contrast uh, to Christians who have had COVID. Little example for you here. This is nothing new. Christians have behaved in this way right the way back to Christ. Let me just tell you about the Anglo-Saxons. There was a conspiracy theory during the Anglo-Saxon era. The conspiracy was this. If you're a Christian and you are blessed by God, then you can't get uh, a disease and you can't get bacterial infections. So if food was dropped on the floor and it fell into uh, the dirt where poo had been, they would pick it up, they'd put it on their plate, they'd sign it with a cross, pray God's blessing over it, and then they would eat it. Because I'm a Christian, I can't catch anything because God has sanctified me. But yet they got sick, and they died, and were very, very ill. Google it. It's a historical fact. There are Christians who have believed that they cannot get touched by anything. And it has been nothing but fake news. It's not a promise of God. It's a confusion to make us think that we as human beings are more powerful than we, we actually are. There's a danger that our faith can become superstition. I'm a Christian, therefore nothing can get me. What are the places this comes from? It comes from Luke 10, 19. Jesus says, I've given you authority to trample on snakes and scorpions and to overcome all the powers of the evil one uh, who will harm you. That verse has been so confused by Christians to believe that they can get away with anything and they can do anything. Let's just look at the example of COVID. Pastor Landon Spreadin, uh, he went and he was teaching about uh, the coronavirus and he went to New Orleans to preach during Mardi Gras and he preached that Christians should not be fearful of COVID because those Christians were protected from it. What happened? A month later, he had died. Let's look at Bishop uh, Gerald Glenn. He preached in his church and said this line, I firmly believe that God is greater than the dreaded virus. He passed away Easter weekend and on Easter Sunday, his congregation had to be told that he had died of COVID. Now, I believe God protects. I believe God is powerful. But I also believe that we have to be sensible. If we have a car and we have car seats in the car, we don't tempt fate. God is not going to protect you from a car accident, so you put your seatbelt on. We need wisdom. Wisdom. And Corinthians uh, 1, chapter 8, verse 1 says this. Paul says, knowledge puffs up, but love builds up. Some of us are susceptible to ideas that make us feel more powerful in a world of, that is very scary and very fearful. If you're somebody who is fearful in the world, there's a danger that you can flip the other way and, and become this, su I'm a superhuman, therefore I don't have to be scared. And they walk around with this pseudo-knowledge, believing that what they know will protect them. And scripture says, knowledge puffs up, 
but love builds up. Conspiracy theories are enticing because we think we know something that others don't. In truth, we've replaced honest doubt with a false certainty. Some of the Christians that I've met during lockdown that have this very strong certainty that God is going to protect them, or this very strong certainty uh, that these things are going on in the world, what they have done is they've replaced honest doubt with a false certainty. In the spiritual world, faith is required. In a natural world, we also need evidence. We need evidence. And that's not me saying, I don't trust God. I totally trust God. If you think I don't trust God, then you completely, you don't know who I am and, and, and what I promote and how I live. John 14, 17, if we are people filled with the spirit, we're filled with the spirit of truth. We have to seek out truth. There's a danger that fake news looks so much like truth. We think if we follow the fake news, oh, I found the real truth. What we find sometimes is not truth at all, but it's a falsehood that looks certain. John 8, 44 says that we should not go around spreading messages from the father of lies. It's possible to be convinced by the wrong things. So what do we need? We need wisdom. I would like to say this. Uh, that we need four things. Scripture, tradition, and reason, and then my fourth one I'll give you in a moment. So first, scripture. Scripture, we have to make sure that we are reading it with the right people and understanding actually what it says, and we don't twist it to say what we don't need it to say. Sometimes we twist it to say something we want it to say because we don't want it to say that. So we have to be very careful that we don't use scripture in the wrong way. But scripture is the foundations of which we build our life. Now there's a danger that sometimes people use scripture to say things that are untrue and falsehoods that are true. But if we want to seek out wisdom, we seek out scripture because scripture is the place uh, that God has spoken. Now second, under scripture we also have what we call tradition. Do we, over the last 2,000 years, see examples of this and how it's been worked out in the past? Has there been the same confusions before? And has there been the same truths before? Because the same God that was around 2,000 years ago, 4,000 years ago, is the same God that's around today and forevermore. So we end up looking at tradition, history. What do we know of the past? What have other Christians believed? And how does that affect today? I love this story of um, the uh, Anglo-Saxons because I think it's a great example where Christians got overconfident in the wrong area and they made themselves sick and ill. So what does scripture say? What does tradition say? What do we know from the past to be true? Three reasons, scripture, tradition and reason. It's these, these three things that the Anglican church is based on. Reason. Is it plausible? Is it plausible is this something that genuinely could happen and make sense in the world that we know scripture tradition and reason do my faculties teach me that this is a wise thing does this sound like something sensible scripture tradition and reason it's these three things that we have to make sure we are listening to because the danger is we might read scripture and get a crazy idea that it sits in total contrast to a tradition and history and reason of what's sensible and makes sense. Scripture, tradition and reason. And the fourth thing is this. What do wise and godly people think? Not just the voices around me. What do others think further afield? There's a danger that we can listen to voices on the internet that sound very plausible, but once we step out of that bubble, we realise it's absolutely bonkers stuff. Some things might sound like wisdom on a YouTube video, but in the reality of life, it is messed up. So we need wisdom, and we need to use scripture, tradition, reason, and we need wise and godly counsel, people around us that we can hear from, from the wider church family. And if you're a part of a tribe that's very small, that believes a very niche thing, we have to ask ourselves, is this sensible? Or have I been duped by something that looks good, but is actually confusing? And the, the last thing I wanna say about 
But all of this is this. I would ask you, it's worth checking your response. Whenever you hear something, how you respond is really important. So we have been told, for example, wear a mask. Uh, doctors have said it. Uh, medics. Uh, 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 the police have said it. The prime minister said it. Priests are saying it. But if you don't want to do it and you're refusing to do it, you have to ask ourselves this question. What is it within you? What is the rebellious spirit within you that is stopping you from playing along from what every other wise voice around you is saying? Sometimes our rebelliousness causes us to, to say no to something uh, that we really should not be saying no to. Our rebellious spirit sometimes is the most unhelpful thing for us. Friends, there are times when I just want to say no to something. I don't want that. And I can find some great spiritual reason why I shouldn't. And actually, when I step back and I think about it wisely, I am being ridiculous. And I have to listen to the voices of wisdom around me. Why do we wear masks right now? We don't just do it because the Prime Minister does. We don't just do it because I don't want to catch COVID. We wear a mask because Jesus calls us to love our neighbour as ourselves. And me wearing a mask is about me caring for and loving everyone else around me. It's not just about me catching something, it's about me not passing something on to somebody else more vulnerable. So how do we discern the spirits? How do we discern wisdom? Scripture, tradition, reason, and wise counsel around us. I hope you find that interesting and I can't wait to hear your discussions on such a topic as this, God, Bill Gates, and the great conspiracy theory.